Welcome to the Center for Languages and Intercultural Communication at Rice University. In oral exams, obviously, we're looking at interaction. Interaction is situated, so it's embedded in a specific uh, context. It's co-constructed by the participants in talking interaction. Through interaction, the participants locally manage their conversational rights. Interaction clearly varies according to the participants and their current local interactional projects. And it's pretty unpredictable. We're looking at interaction because basically we want to look at the student's uh, interactional competence, which can be defined as the ability to manage the variability of interaction in and through the interaction itself. Recent definitions of um, interactional competence say that basically interactional competence is the ability to accomplish meaningful social actions and to respond to co-participants' previous actions in a recognizable way. And we do this uh, through a number of linguistic and embodied resources that are combined or laminated in a variety of ways. And we also need a fair understanding of how uh, the sequential organization of turns and actions uh, work. So they consist of various phases, uh, candidate only phase, candidate candidate phase, candidate candidate teacher examiner phase. Well, what multipartial exams allow for is that to basically engage the students in a wider range of, of tasks. Um, so from the teacher examiner point of view, you can get a wider range of language samples and you can test your students on a bigger number, on a, on a greater number of communicative functions. Basically, you engage students in different speech exchange system, just to be very, very, you know, concrete. So ordinary conversation, like the chat with your friend, is one speech exchange system, where, for example, turn and location is not predetermined. Uh, anybody can start repair. Whereas, for example, and yeah, there is, of course, a sequence organization, but it's not an answer, question, answer, question, answer type of thing. Uh, or at least it's not set that way at the beginning. On the other hand, in an interview, like a job interview or the OPI interview, for example, uh, you have a completely different speech exchange system where turn allocation is not free. Uh, repair, who can initiate repair on what and how, that's also different. Uh, and typically, uh, interviews are organized as a series of question and answer sequences. Now we're going to look at two phases of a multi-part oral exam that was implemented at a U.S. university. In the first clip, we will listen to the interaction between two first-semester students of Italian as a foreign language. Erika, che cosa ti piace fare in tempo libero? Mi piace leggere un libro buono, mi piace uscire con i miei amici, so if we look at interactions in pairs or groups, well, one advantage, it's practical, you know two or three or four of them together, okay, at the same time, not one, not one by one. Then conversational rights are more symmetrically distributed and you should have a better chance to, you know, a collaborative and more sort of equal type of uh, interaction. In a way, you can make better inferences in terms of, you know, what the kind of skills actually are in daily communicative situations, mm -hmm. might be. And definitely there is a link with teaching practices, assuming that we all use a lot of, you know, pair work, group work in the classroom. The students are used to it. That's what they do. This type of test would be ecologically valid. It's familiar to students and it for fosters, you know, more group work in the classroom. And here is what students think about exams done in groups. It's okay. Um, a exam finale dovrebbe essere un exam in gruppi. Mm. Ooh, si, sí, si. Sí. It's okay. Uh, Questa idea è... Molto bene, uh, perché imparando una, una lingua straniera è importante per usare con 
uh, altre persone come amici o altri studenti italiani. Sì. Students also notice that in an interaction with a peer, they try to balance the speaking time that each of them gets, therefore making the interaction more symmetrical, more equal, in a way that resembles what happens in ordinary conversation. Let's now look at what happens when a student interacts with his teacher. Okay, um, Ben, hai detto che ti piace ascoltare la musica. Che musica ti piace ascoltare? L'opera. Uh, L'opera per uh, Verdi, Puccini e Mozart. Benissimo. Perché tu studi? Sì, uh, uh, io cantare. Okay. Tu canti, benissimo. Oh, io canto. What are some advantages of the interaction with the teacher examiner? So the input is uniform, fairly standard. Everybody gets the same thing, more or less. Therefore, it's an impartial test. And the criteria for standardized tests of this kind have been tested and validated. Okay? On the other hand, conversational rights are distributed in an asymmetrical uh, way. The examiner is in control, so it's a one-way interaction with the examiner basically doing most of the work in, my, in one perspective, because it's the examiner that is constantly prompting uh, the student. Uh, the other disadvantage is that it's not necessarily linked to the classroom uh, context. So there might be an issue of ecological validity and task familiarity in the sense that the students are not used to interacting one-on-one -on -one with their teacher, you know, interviewing them all the time. Students do perceive the asymmetric nature of this type of interaction that is guided by the questions of the teacher examiner. The result is a one-sided conversation. So the idea, again, is to use these multi-part oral tests because they are impartial, because basically they, they address the issues that you have with each different type of, of, of exam. The other thing is that, well, they do take into account the fact that variability is an inherent feature of the construct being tested. And at the same time, there are more valid also in the sense that basically they give you a sense of what the students can do in a variety of settings uh, with a variety of interlocutors. And again, the fact that there is the, this idea that uh, there might be a link, a uh, better link between teaching practices and uh, assessment. As a teacher and as a researcher, I became interested in multi-part oral exams and I decided to study them with a conversational analytic lens. So I used uh, conversation analysis, and which is defined, like the basic definition is that it's a naturalistic observational discipline. So CA is meant for observing what is actually happening, not something that has been set up, but typically a naturally occurring interaction. So an interaction that would happen anyway, no matter what. And typically these interactions are transcribed according to painstaking CA conventions, takes forever, don't do that, uh, or do, but be prepared. Uh, and then basically you conduct a very rigorous empirical sequential analysis of the data, and then you try to approach the data with what it's called an emic perspective, meaning that you don't approach the data with sort of preset categories, but you try to basically let the data speak to you. I collected the data at an American university that implemented multi-part oral exams in its Italian program. The exams consisted of two phases, a student-student phase and a student-teacher phase. I video recorded exams that were conducted at the end of Italian 101, a first semester course, and at the end of Italian 104, a fourth semester course. Overall, the participants were 36 students and three teachers. We are now going to focus on the student-student phase of the exam. So the exam goes for Italian 101 and 104. Uh, basically, the idea was that the students had learned effective strategies of communicating in Italian in everyday basic situations for Italian 101 and beyond the basic level in Italian 104. Topics were formulated as questions, and the students were required to have a real conversation, whatever that means, in which they had to ask and answer questions related to the given topics. And these were the instructions from 101 for 101 students. Um, Italian 104 students were told that they had to have a dialogue. So basically, if you look at the instructions, you can see how the policy expectations are that conversation 
is basically a series of question and answer sequences. Okay. Um, so these are the instructions for um, Italian 101 students. Uh, they were going to be required to converse on the following topics. So first topic, what do you like doing? What do you do in your free time? Then how's your family? Which holiday do you like the most? Do you remember a holiday in particular? What did you do? Ciao Beppe, come inside. Ciao Diana, sono Bene e e tu? Bene Andre, sai con più per la fame? Sì, io sono felice che è estate. E tu? Andre a me. Che facendo la fame? Io sono una cameriera. E tu? Lavoro in un campo con i bambini. Che pensate? What's interesting? is that not only did this person planned what she was going to say, but she also kind of knew in advance what the other person was going to tell her. So, you know, she wrote here, bene anche, well too, and anche a me, to me too. So the two elements really got me when I, when I was reading this. I was like, oh my goodness, I mean, they, <laughs> they really planned this thing. So this is something that, yes, can happen. So... In a way, yes, it's all about being prepared. Remember that preparedness was one uh, of the grading criterion. There is clearly a mismatch between <laughs> what the teachers envision as preparedness and what the students envision preparedness. So for the teachers, probably, it was the ability to converse on given topics, whatever they were. And for the students, it was like, yeah, I can do a rehearsed performance and I can memorize a script. The other thing, Basically, we all agree that this is not ordinary conversation. At the same time, there is an attempt on, you know, from the students in trying to use things that we use in ordinary conversation, like the how interesting bit. I mean, yes, it sounded awful, but uh, it was there. It's an attempt. So let's look at what happens in uh, 104. So they had to talk about which piece of information that you learned in the course had been particularly interesting or surprising. They had to talk about whether the, uh, during the semester the image of Italy and Italians had changed and how, and where they think that there are similarities or differences between uh, Italy and the States. Ciao. Ciao, come stai? Uh, sto bene, e tu? Ho stato. Uh, mi dispiace. Um, che cosa hai imparato in questo corso, questo semestre? Uh, ho imparato molto sulla società, sulla cucina delle regioni italiane. E tu? Um, ho imparato a cercare le molte regioni. Sì? Qual è la tua preferita? Uh, la regione che mi piace più è la regione della Lombardia. Perché? Uh, perché mi piace la moda e la cucina. Uh, tu sai che uh, la città uh, di Milano è la capitale della moda del mondo? Sì, ho visto la tua presentazione. Sì, sì. They seem to be trying to act out a script of ordinary conversation, so they engage in the greeting sequence. They speak with very short turns of talk. You can see how basically the topics are prompted through questions, okay? So basically they do comply with the test, with, with, with the test instructions. You have to ask each other questions. And this is actually um, one of the things that I decided to look at. So in all this, you know, sort of relatively small corpus, how do the students actually ask each other questions, since that is how the instructions were formulated. I found that both first semester and fourth semester students use topic initiating questions, topic elaboration questions, reci reciprocation questions, the magic formula and you to sort of, you know, give the floor to somebody else, and other initiation of repair, even though there are differences in the way students at different proficiency levels use the questions. And then something that only one of four students did, well, first of all, one of four students have a greater variation in the way they use repair they also uh, try to uh, pursue agreement or confirmation from their interlocutor. And they also try to, again, use these little tokens uh, as markers of news receipt and confirmation. Very simple means, uh, linguistically speaking, but they are trying to do something else, something different that the first semester students don't do. 
then different is in terms of the two groups of students, 101 and 104. So 101 students mainly accomplish speaking, speaker transition through questions as a way to hand the floor to the interlocutor and to allow the interlocutor to cover the topics that, they, that are indicated in the test agenda. And they frequently recycle the language using the instructions. Okay, so 104 students sometimes do this, but sometimes they are also able to self-select. Uh, so they are not just there sort of, you know, waiting for a question to be asked to them. They sometimes use different language other than the language that is specified in instructions, and they seem to engage more with each other's talk. So, for example, you know, read there and other types of questions that they ask to each other. Uh, perché negli Stati Uniti uh, ogni Stato uh, usano uh, solo una lingua, ma in Italia è molto diverso. Sì, nelle regioni italiane uh, ci sono molte tradizioni diverse. Come nella Calabria uh, ci sono... Oh, uh, <laughs> i calabresi parlano uh, albanese e greco. Sì, e io cito delle ogni regione d'Italia e uh, sono diverso. Uh, uh, personalmente preferisco il cibo di Italia e Romagna uh, e il prosciutto è come già da già. Il prosciutto quando va? Uh, qualche volta, ma uh, solitamente, solitamente uh, su un video con altre carne uh, italiane e formaggi, ma uh, quando sono qui a scuola non posso uh, mangiare uh, il prosciutto, uh, invece mangiare il prosciutto americano che è molto peggio, ma va bene. Uh, quale tipo di, di cibo preferisci? Attualmente io preferisco il caffè. Uh, il caffè è una tradizione più vecchia nel Napoli, uh, dove si trova la macchina che si chiama la moca che fa il caffè. Uh, è interessante che per i napoletani uh, il caffè è un um, their interaction is very different. Uh, there are virtually no questions. Uh, there is only, uh, at some point, she asks about, so what about the ham and melon and cantaloupe type of thing? Uh, and then he asks a reciprocation question. Uh, and it's interesting because it's used in a different way. It's not, you know, a reciprocation question that elicits exactly, so, you know, like the, uh, what do you like doing in your free time? I like this, blah, 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 blah. And you, I like this, blah, 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 blah. It's like I'm talking about food in general. So what about you and food, okay? So um, he's asking for Sean's take on something that he had developed. Uh, and it was not prompted by a question. No matter how we look at it, I mean, we send them to interact with the native speakers. We have them interact with each other. We interview them. It's still testing, and testing is not ordinary conversation. It's a type of institutional interaction that has a very specific goal, that of sampling language to be graded. So it has an institutional goal, uh, and therefore there's so much, in a way, in terms of ordinary conversation that we can expect out of these, realistically speaking. What is being tested? Again, interactional competencies in the plural. Yes, interactional competence in institutional settings, for sure. Uh, in ordinary conversation, how? Are we testing like the ability of students to switch <laughs> back and forth from one thing to another? Um, are we testing the students' test-taking ability? That's also something that, you know, like the preparedness type of uh, issue. And so we really have to think about, you know, how do we choose, interpret, and use the grading criteria, and how, you know, these grading criteria reflect our idea of what interactional competence is or should look like.